why don't we go ahead and get started here um, on this sort of breakout session or workshop on ECG interpretation in athletes. Um, this uh, session is uh, hosted in part by the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine and the AMSSM Foundation, um, and also um, uh, sort of powered by uh, UW Medicine Center for Sports Cardiology here um, in Seattle. Um, what we're going to uh, do is maybe at a slightly slower pace, uh, walk through some of the ECGs that we've seen throughout the day, um, looking at some of the basic um, uh, ECG interpretation uh, findings that we'll want to want to do. Um, there is an advanced workshop as well that we, we mentioned. Um, in, in formulating this uh, workshop, initially we were thinking we might go through a stack of ECGs individually. Um, there are some other uh, speakers and faculty in the room, uh, Mike Emery and, and Joe Merrick, um, who can help us at, sort of at the end if there still are questions. I, I would encourage you to, to go up to them individually and, and ask your question or ask me, um, et cetera, or walk through some of the ECG examples sort of one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, uh, hopefully, um, this talk on basic ECG interpretation in athletes is part of the new ECG training modules um, that will match the international criteria. Um, and there's also an advanced ECG interpretation uh, module, and, and these will come with some sort of post-test questions, et cetera. And then there are four others that, that we will also populate as, as training modules with lots of ECG examples on normal physiologic changes, uh, ECG abnormalities in cardiomyopathy, ECG abnormalities in primary electrical disease, and then just some uh, challenging uh, cases for ECG interpretation or, or common pitfalls. So stay tuned for those. Uh, again, uh, what we're going to follow today follows the, the new international recommendations for ECG interpretation in athletes, um, provides a, a new standard endorsed by lots of uh, sports medicine and cardiology societies. Um, and it's freely available on uh, BJSM uh, site. We've seen this slide a number of times, but again, um, walking through some of the, the green box or normal ECG findings, our borderline ECG findings or yellow flag um, and, and red flag abnormal ECG findings. So my learning objectives for this workshop is to recognize common physiologic ECG findings related to cardiac adaptation in, in trained athletes. And these are the ones we're going to uh, walk through listed there. Voltage criteria for LVH, early repolarization, incomplete right bundle branch block, uh, juvenile T wave inversion, the black athlete repolarization variants, and uh, some of the uh, junctional and ectopic rhythms. And then in the second half, sort of move to uh, a second objective, which is to identify the abnormal ECG findings that really do warrant further evaluation to confirm or exclude cardiac pathology. And for those, we'll look at lateral and infralateral T wave inversion that we've talked a lot about today, the ST segment depression, pathologic Q waves, and uh, ventricular pre excitation. And if some of this is uh, repetitive to what we did this morning, I, I think that's okay, actually. I think these are not the types of ECGs that we see all the time. Um, and so sometimes looking at them a lot um, will be good for the memory bank. When I look at an ECG, there's a few questions that I want to ask before I start my interpretation. The first is, you know, I'm going to look at this ECG ultimately to understand, am I classifying this as normal or abnormal? Normal, no further evaluation needed. Abnormal, further evaluation is, is recommended. And also, if the ECG is, is abnormal, what is specifically the ECG abnormality? Because in the new international recommendations, there's a nice clear guide or link from that ECG abnormality to what we think the appropriate next step is uh, in the evaluation. And I think it's important also that if we have relevant clinical information, uh, this is helpful in the ECG interpretation. Um, age, race, and sex may influence how we interpret the ECG. And also uh, confirming, if we can, this is an asymptomatic athlete with no family history of inherited cardiac disease or sudden cardiac death. Each of those, in a different context, may adjust a little bit or modify how we interpret the, the ECG, of course. So let's take a moment and look at um, this case in a 21-year-old African-American male. Um, and I'll just ask, is, does this ECG look normal or abnormal? Again, as, I, as you guys look at this, I'll walk through how I look at this ECG, um, just as this first example. My eyes start with, with, with V1 looking for uh, abnormal finding, excuse me, that would um, classify this ECG as abnormal. Are there pathologic Q waves? Um, 
a very wide QRS duration? Is there uh, SE segment depression or uh, T wave inversion? And as I walk through V1, V2, V3, um, over to V4, V5, V6, I don't see any of those uh, findings. I do, of course, see some early repolarization and, and high voltage. If I come over here to um, AVF, AVL, uh, again, looking for Q waves, um, SE segment depression, T wave inversion in two, and then in lead one, I, I don't see those. Um, it's upright in, uh, in two in AVF. It's a, a normal axis. I come down to two, and I'm looking at the, the rhythm here. Um, I get a general sense of the, the QT uh, interval. Uh, we just had a wonderful talk on, on Mike Ackerman. We're going to spend more time on that later. Um, as you might remember, the, the big box here is 200 milliseconds, and the little boxes are, are 40 milliseconds. So if we find a QRS that starts roughly on the beginning of a, of a, of a big box and ends roughly about the end of a, another big box, that's about a 400 QT interval. And then, of course, you'd correct it for heart rate for QTC. And then um, just generally scanning the, e the ECG for other findings that might classify it as abnormal, the pre-excitation, wide QRS, uh, bundle branch blocks, uh, et cetera. So this is an ECG that really is just um, is, is a normal ECG, has some common findings uh, for athletes, specifically that high voltage, the early repolarization, and the sinus bradycardia, and, and this would not require um, any uh, additional evaluation. Interestingly, this ECG was, was read a little differently um, uh, in its interpretation. And so overall, um, if you're not interpreting the ECG in the, in the context of a young athlete who's healthy and asymptomatic, this might be some of the, the verbiage that's there. Um, and so the cardiology interpretation here included the possibility of acute pericarditis versus early repol and really called it a, a borderline ECG. And if you didn't have the clinical context, I think that's uh, an appropriate remark. But if you do know this is an asymptomatic, healthy young athlete, um, then it's a normal ECG. Here's another example we've seen uh, earlier of isolated increased QRS voltage uh, uh, surpassing uh, the Sokolov uh, Leon uh, criteria for uh, voltage, which is over uh, 35, the, the summation of the S wave in V1 plus the R wave in, in V5 or V6. Uh, in this instance, uh, 53 millimeters, but, but regardless of the voltage or the amplitude, no matter how high it is, um, isolated increased QRS voltage is a normal finding. So let's look at uh, another ECG, a 29-year-old Caucasian male soccer player. This ECG also has a number of normal findings uh, in athletes. Again, it does have the voltage, but this ECG really highlights some of the early repolarization findings. Um, uh, here with the arrows, uh, dominantly in the lateral leads and inferior leads, J-point elevation, SD segment elevation, and then, of course, the, the tall uh, peak T waves as well. These are common training-related findings um, um, that do not require more evaluation. Early polarization has uh, different definitions, and um, in the international recommendations, we pretty much classified all of the definitions of early polarization as within normal in an asymptomatic athlete um, with no concerning family history. In uh, panel A that you see there is a uh, classic SC uh, segment elevation and J-point elevation. In panel B, um, what's called a J-wave uh, here uh, along uh, or preceding uh, the J-point. In some uh, early polarization after the J-point, you actually get a downsloping or, or, or terminal QRS uh, slurring. Um, and then here's a, yet another uh, variant of early polarization. All of these have something to do with um, uh, elevated uh, J points or some uh, amount of SE segment elevation um, in our uh, normal patterns of early repolarization, especially in our athletes. Here's another uh, ECG for us to look at, a 16-year-old Caucasian male. As we scan through that, this is an example of incomplete right bundle branch block. Some of the classic findings for uh, incomplete right bundle um, would be a QRS that's less than 120 milliseconds and that R, S, R prime uh, in V1. Here's another example of incomplete right bundle branch block. Uh, again, uh, sort of a, a large uh, R prime wave uh, in V1. Uh, this QRS duration is 110 milliseconds. There are no other ECG um, borderline or uh, 
uh, red flag uh, ECG abnormalities. This is a normal ECG in a young athlete. This is a 12-year-old uh, Caucasian male. And again, when I look at this ECG, I want to uh, overall categorize it. Is this normal or an abnormal ECG? Um, as suspected with a 12-year-old, what we're, what we're uh, demonstrating here is a juvenile pattern of T-wave inversion, um, where you can see the arrows pointing here to um, T-wave inversion that's in V1, V2, and V3, um, which would be considered a normal finding in individuals less than 16 years old, regardless of race um, in our athletic uh, asymptomatic population. A couple other examples of juvenile uh, T-wave inversion. And I just want to uh, demonstrate also for purposes of our definition of juvenile T wave inversion that this is really confined to leads V1 through V3 and, and not necessarily um, beyond that into V4. That is not the black athlete repolarization variant that we're talking about. We're talking about the young athlete, less than 16 year old, juvenile T wave inversion that hasn't um, um, moved towards the uh, adult repolarization just quite yet. So this is uh, yet another ECG, a 27-year-old black African uh, uh, male. And I think at this point, everyone here is recognizing that this is a, a black athlete repolarization variant. Um, so let's uh, dive into that a little bit deeper and just show what it looks like uh, in, in close-up. Um, when you look at um, repolarization in, in the black athlete, we're talking about ST uh, uh, J-point elevation followed by a convex or domed uh, SD segment into uh, T wave inversion. Um, this finding is confined to leads V1 through V4 and never extends beyond V4 into V5 or V6. This seems to be uh, more common in, in um, black athletes uh, of true African uh, descent or Afro Caribbean descent, a little less common in the US uh, African American athlete population, perhaps some. Um, mixed racial uh, influence there or genetic dilution, uh, but regardless, uh, a, a normal variant pattern. Here's yet another example of the black athlete repolarization variant, again, looking at the findings in uh, uh, V1, V2, uh, and V3. Um, this uh, ECG also shows some uh, striking voltage uh, findings as well. So just to hit home again, um, when it, not only is the, the pattern and the morphology or the phenotype of that repolarization um, uh, different uh, than more concerning pathologic repolarization, uh, but it also uh, is in sometimes different leads. So that black athlete uh, variant shown here in panel A, again, confined to leads one, uh, V1 through V4, and uh, in panel B, a more concerning type of uh, repolarization more concerning in a couple ways. Uh, first of all, that the T-wave inversion uh, extends into V5 and V6, so uh, automatically a red flag that would uh, trigger more investigation to rule out pathology. There's also a little bit of ST segment depression. And then I just also want to say that um, the, the ST segment is either, um, in this particular case, either uh, d depressed or, or downsloping. So there's no SC segment elevation. And, and in uh, pathologic TVM inversion, most of the time, it seems to be either flat, isoelectric, uh, downsloping, or depressed to go with it. This is an 18 year old uh, Hispanic female. We'll take a time uh, to walk through uh, this ECG. Again, looking for uh, pathologic Q waves, uh, ST segment depression, T wave inversion. Don't see that. Look at the axis. Coming down on the rhythm strip here, and it's sort of hard to find exactly where our P waves are. If we go to our next uh, panel, this is an example of a junctional escape rhythm. In this particular view, we have some P waves that are uh, hidden within or after uh, the QRS complex that you can see there um, with the red arrows. Example of the P wave there, P wave there, P wave probably hidden uh, within the QRS uh, immediately before, et cetera. One of the things that uh, is the hallmark feature of a junctional escape rhythm is that the, the rate is very consistent, um, that you have a consistent RR interval uh, between uh, the beats, and you can map this out very well um, when you look at the ECG. 
uh, general escape rhythms are a normal finding in athletes, and they go right back in the sinus as they exercise. This does not need more uh, evaluation. Here's another example of a, a junctional escape rhythm that is probably a little bit more obvious. Again, you have some uh, P waves here that maybe are so close they're, they're not necessarily conducted, but, but then you have a very consistent RR interval. This is again and just another example of a junctional escape rhythm. You might hear the term ectopic atrial rhythm or low atrial rhythm. So what does this mean? Uh, it means that there is a uh, electrical impulse that's coming from the atria down to the AV node, but perhaps from somewhere different than the, the sinus node. Um, in, in this particular ECG, for a low atrial rhythm, which is one of the more common ectopic, ectopic atrial rhythms, you see an inverted P wave in the inferior leaves, 2, 3, and AVF. This is relatively uh, common. This is a normal finding. This does not require additional investigation. So we talked about some of the, the normal findings. Let's move to some of our red flag uh, abnormal findings and, and also uh, think about what that uh, secondary evaluation would be. So this is a 20-year-old African-American male. Again, first question I'm going to ask, is this a normal or abnormal ECG? As I walk through here, as I go down from uh, V1, V2, as I get into V3 here, I'm starting to see what seems like the black repolarization variant, J-point elevation, uh, domed or convex SD elevation into an a inverted uh, T wave, maybe in V4 as well, but that never extends as a normal variant into V5 and V6 um, or into the inferior leads to an AVF. Um, this is an abnormal ECG, of course, uh, demonstrating infralateral uh, T wave inversion. Um, Again, T wave inversion in V5, V6, always abnormal. And we shouldn't be fooled by some of the uh, perhaps uh, normal findings that we see concurrent um, with that uh, abnormal, uh, abnormal findings as well. In the international uh, recommendations, as, as we talked, it's important to know what the uh, precise definitions are. Um, and this is uh, quite helpful. Um, we saw this slide earlier, again, just sort of comparing the, the black athlete repolarization variant um, in contrast to pathologic T wave inversion in panel B. Uh, again, a difference in both where it occurs, isolated or confined to V1 through V4 and the normal variant pattern for black athletes um, versus uh, perhaps extending into V5, V6 and um, uh, cardiac pathology, and also in the, I think, the morphology of what that um, ST segment looks like, um, either elevated versus uh, flat, uh, downsloping, or depressed. So if we go back to uh, this, the question, uh, this is the same ECG, that, uh, this is another, excuse me, another example of infralateral uh, T wave inversion. And one of the questions is, well, what do we do next? We had some great uh, lectures on this earlier, talking about the evaluation of infralateral T wave inversion, um, where it begins with an echocardiogram, and cardiac MRI is really a, a routine or standard uh, recommendation for this ECG phenotype. Here's an example of uh, lateral T wave inversion, uh, a little bit more subtle in, in V5, uh, with a small T wave inversion, only one lead here. This is new to the international recommendations. Um, where uh, all you need is T wave inversion, either V5 or V6, just one lead, not two contiguous leads, uh, to, to flag the ECG as abnormal and require more investigation. Um, I think this is one of the, 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 the grayer areas of, of just how much do you work up an athlete that has this ECG. Um, I think that we'd all agree if the, the T wave inversion of V5 or V6 was more than a couple millimeters or what we'd call deep T wave inversion, um, that it would sort of qualify more as a markedly abnormal ECG that really warrants that cardiac MRI. I do not think getting a cardiac MRI in this situation would ever be wrong. The question is, do we need to do it in everyone? I don't know if we have that clear answer. Um, so for sure, I would say that you should consider, you know, after echo, um, if there's any uh, concerning findings on the echo, you'd want to consider that cardiac MRI. If the 2A inversion is more than 2 millimeters, I think you need the cardiac MRI. If there's any other concurrent ECG abnormalities, um, SE segment depression, um, left atrial enlargement, um, 
uh, left axis deviation or any of those that go with uh, this T wave inversion, I think you need the cardiac MRI as well. And then, of course, the serial or annual follow up if, if your, uh, your workup uh, initially is non diagnostic. Yet another example that I think we've seen uh, earlier today on uh, abnormal ECGs, uh, again, just trying to uh, contrast what we saw in the ECG before, sort of a subtle T wave inversion to more marked or a T wave inversion. This athlete, for sure, I think would need an echo followed by a cardiac MRI as that minimum investigation. And then important to note um, for gray zone findings uh, on echo and cardiac MRI, so let's say that the the wall thickness is uh, 13 or 14 millimeters. We're not sure if it's not clearly in the pathologic range. Um, that, that Holter monitor and stress testing become very important to try to help distinguish is this um, cardiac uh, adaptation regular exercise or this really underlying pathology. No one would miss this as a markedly abnormal ECG um, showing infralateral T of inversion, SC segment depression. And I just want to um, comment a little bit more on some of this investigation that is recommended and why. We heard from Dr. Owens about the um, apical uh, variant uh, HCM that is sometimes just not seen well on echocardiogram. We can't get the ultrasound probe quite perpendicular to where the apex of the heart is, so you may miss or misjudge um, just how uh, thick um, uh, the left ventricular wall is uh, in those segments. And that's why the, the panel for the international recommendations really believe that cardiac MRI should be a routine diagnostic test for this uh, ECG uh, pattern and this ECG phenotype. This was, I think, highlighted a little bit uh, by uh, work from uh, Dr. Sanjay Sharma and his group uh, that uh, looked for differences, um, excuse me, that uh, evaluate the clinical profile of athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And, and differences in, in left ventricular hypertrophy patterns between athletes uh, with HCM and sedentary HCM patients. And so if we break this down a little bit, what you can see is sort of where, where did the hypertrophy occur? Um, and so for in our uh, sedentary individuals with HCM, uh, you had uh, in red apical uh, variant HCM of about 12 percent. But in our athletes who were diagnosed with HCM, nearly 36% actually had apical variant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So again, when we see an athlete who has lateral T wave inversion or infralateral T wave inversion, it's really uh, becoming on us that we have to rule out not just cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but we have to make sure we get a good look at the apex and rule out apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that is difficult to do on echocardiogram alone. We touched on this as well, um, but I do want to highlight a couple things. Um, you know, sometimes when we get the cardiac imaging with echo um, or MRI, we're, we're still not sure of the diagnosis. Um, so again, let's say we have sort of gray zone thickness in that, in that 13 to 15 millimeter range. Um, there's, there's, there's no late ganolytium enhancement. Um, there's no family history. They don't have any um, uh, clear warning symptoms, et cetera. Um, what else can be helpful? And that's where I think the exercise ECG uh, testing and Holter monitoring can be quite helpful. Um, and in those uh, such cases, the presence of ventricular tachycardia during exercise um, or on a Holter monitor um, would probably support the, the diagnosis of uh, pathologic cardiac uh, disease. And then, of course, uh, the annual follow-up is recommended in all these individuals who are not diagnosed with an illness but have one of these markedly abnormal ECGs that we need to follow them for the development of cardiomyopathy over time. And in really in two different studies, one in 2008 by Dr. Plicia and then in 2015 by Schnell and colleagues, both actually found a 6 percent risk long term of developing cardiomyopathy in a group who had a markedly abnormal ECG but initially normal cardiac imaging. In my own experience, and we're going to talk about this later uh, today, this is an example uh, of a 19-year-old African-American uh, male college basketball player who had a screening ECG with some of these, um, with an initially sort of subtle ECG uh, T wave inversion in V5 and also in V4. This was flagged as abnormal. Uh, we did do an echo and a cardiac MRI when he was a freshman. Um, it was non-diagnostic, and we followed him over time. Two years later, his ECG was uh, quite different, um, now markedly abnormal. He had been followed with serial echocardiogram, but two years later, we also got 
uh, a repeat cardiac MRI, and at that point his hypertrophy was, was uh, quite diagnostic for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, maximal uh, wall thickness of 20 millimeters, and the development of some late gadolinium enhancement or cardiac fibrosis as well. This is his uh, 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 view on his uh, uh, cardiac MRI, midventricular short axis views uh, in uh, 2008 versus uh, 2010. Uh, and you can see the, the development of, of, from gray zone sort of findings of 13 millimeter hypertrophy into the pathologic range, um, and just to, to again show what ECGs overlie that. And so um, often those ECG manifestations will come first, and then the pathologic hypertrophy later, but definitely something that we need to be following. There's another ECG, a 24-year-old African-American male. Um, Again, I think we can all see the, the SC7 depression, and in this case, the infralateral T wave inversion as well. So, uh, represented a, from a patient that was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Sometimes the SC segment depression is the only finding that we see, um, such as in this case, this abnormal ECG, uh, also in a patient who had HCM, uh, and you can uh, pretty clearly appreciate the SC segment depression uh, in V3 through V6. When they're, um, and this evaluation really begins with an echocardiogram and certainly to consider a cardiac MRI um, and additional testing based on the initial findings from the echo or other clinical suspicion. So what does this ECG show? This is an 18-year-old Caucasian male. I don't think you've actually seen this ECG earlier today. I'll let you guys stare at it for just a second. So this ECG shows uh, some pathologic Q waves in, in two in AVF, um, and we have a new definition of pathologic Q waves now compared to the uh, Seattle criteria. Um, the new definition is, is clearly improving our specificity um, as well as our sensitivity uh, to detect a disease. The new definition, a QR ratio uh, greater or equal to um, uh, 0.25 or 25 percent, so a Q wave that is more than 25 percent of the ensuing R wave or a Q wave that is uh, wide or more than 40 milliseconds in duration. This particular ECG is in a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy, and there's some other findings that go along with it. The old criteria is out for um, diagnosing pathologic Q waves, where we had a three millimeter cutoff um, of depth, um, basically looking at long, skinny Q waves, um, and this just led to too many false positives and, and, and no improvement in disease detection. So another example uh, of pathologic Q waves with the new criteria, uh, this is actually an 18-year-old uh, collegiate swimmer with a screening ECG who had um, uh, pathologic uh, Q waves that you can see here in V4 through V6, as well as one in AVL. Um, she ultimately was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So in this ECG, 22-year-old Caucasian male, Again, as my eyes come down and I look at this, almost immediately I sort of feel like I see a short PR and, and a delta wave that comes through. This is an example of ventricular pre-excitation or Wolf-Parkinson-White pattern. Uh, we heard a little bit about that earlier. Um, some of the classic findings here, a short PR less than 120 milliseconds, the delta waves, also a large Q wave in, in lead three, um, and lack of a Q wave in lead uh, V6. Another example of uh, ventricular pre-excitation, and here I've just sort of broken up what we think about as the classic WPW findings uh, versus um, sort of additional findings that support the diagnosis. So the classic findings, again, just to hit it home, a short PR less than 120 milliseconds, uh, delta wave that we can see with the, the, the slurring, uh, and a wide QRS more than 120 milliseconds. And then some other findings that would, again, support the diagnosis, these large Q waves in lead three and the absence of a Q wave uh, in V6. Uh, ST segment depression is also another finding that uh, goes along with uh, ventricular pre is just not shown in this uh, particular ECG.
We saw this ECG earlier. Again, just another example of uh, Wolf Parkinson White pattern or ventricular preexcitation. So we heard from Dr. Salerno about the evaluation of WPW, and I, I really want to make sure this is, is clear. Um, it's not just getting an exercise ECG test for, for tolerance or, or usual uh, protocols. We're really looking for that abrupt cessation of the delta wave and pre-excitation um, that would denote a low-risk pathway. I think if you're uh, within the primary care field or within the sports medicine field and you're referring a patient to a cardiologist because of the diagnosis of a ventricular pre-excitation or WPW, uh, when you get back to their evaluation, you sort of want to understand what they, they do. I, I've been in situations where the person was referred to the cardiologist and there was no risk assessment. They didn't have an exercise stress test. Um, I've also been in situations where they had the exercise stress test and there's no comment on whether or not they, I, I can't, I don't understand for sure whether or not they actually looked at um, the delta wave, um, was there abrupt cessation, et cetera. So again, just making sure that everyone's on the same page, that you can be your patient's advocate to not only make sure they have appropriate risk stratification, but that um, the study was uh, looked at uh, correctly, and in most circumstances, it certainly will be. And then just a final consideration, um, temporary restriction or not. And, and this is difficult. We, we, we talked a lot about this with the international uh, recommendations. Um, and I'll just sort of read a little bit what th that's here and then reflect upon it with my own thoughts. But temporary restriction from athletic activity should be considered for athletes with abnormal ECGs, especially when there is high clinical suspicion for pathologic cardiac disease until secondary investigations are completed. And then in, in a case by case basis, perhaps conditional clearance for sports participation pending further evaluation might be considered. Um, when we formed the Seattle criteria, I think we had a mix of sort of more sinister abnormalities like lateral and infralateral T inversion and SC segment depression mixed in with what I would call most minor abnormalities, left atrial enlargement, left axis deviation. Um, I think no one in the room would, would argue if you held out temporarily an athlete with infralateral T wave inversion until you've had their workup complete. Um, do you do the same thing for an athlete just who has left axis deviation or left atrial enlargement? So when we had the Seattle criteria, I think there was a little bit of a, a mix there. I think now the, the criteria set is really set up that if it is in the red box, it really is a, a, an abnormality that, that deserves our attention and deserves a workup. The, the yield is going to be a little bit higher than, than it has been in, in other criteria. And I think in most circumstances, you're, you're, you're probably justified and safest to hold that athlete out temporarily until the workup is, is complete. Um, but again, uh, in certain circumstances, uh, um, you, you may provide uh, different recommendations. So again, um, just looking at some ECGs, the first and perhaps most important question is how are you going to classify it? Is it going to be normal or abnormal? Um, hopefully we can tell the difference between these two ECGs at this point in the day. Um, and again, that the international um, recommendations and, and new criteria can do a, uh, help us in a, with a more accurate assessment of these ECGs so we can classify them correctly. Um, I'm going to stop there and, and thank you guys for your attention. I know we've looked at a lot of ECGs. Um, I will uh, answer any questions and also ask that if you guys do have questions that perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Merrick and Dr. Emery um, can chime in as well. Um, if you want to look at ECG or ECG examples one-on-one -on -one with any of us, happy to do that as well. So thank you very much.